so I am a member of the Mohawk Nation. Um, grew up on the Ganawage Mohawk Reserve near Montreal. I am a consultant pediatrician um, and have done extensive work with the Northern and Native Child Health Program of the Montreal Children's Hospital, serving as a consultant pediatrician for the Cree Nation, Inuit, and Mohawk Nation as well. And, and you know, we have uh, served many different nations at the Montreal Children's Hospital in addition as well. I am also doing some work at McGill University, and I am the director of the Indigenous Health Teaching Curriculum at the Medical School uh, at uh, McGill University. I've been doing that for uh, a little over five or six years now, and I am also the head of a program called the Indigenous Health Professions Program at McGill University in the Faculty of Medicine, where we're trying to recruit a lot more Indigenous students into all the health fields, uh, medicine, nursing, physio, OT, and others. Um, so today, though, I'm going to focus on what we've been doing with the Canadian Pediatric Society and National Collaborating Centre on a teaching curriculum for Indigenous child health. I have not done this alone, um, and I want to acknowledge uh, many partners who have uh, helped along the way. Uh, we actually had a small committee working with me on this one, uh, so I just wanted to recognize Dr. James Irvine uh, from Saskatchewan, um, who has been a long-standing member of the First Nations Inuit and Metis Health Committee, who helped. Dr. Rada Jetty, who is a pediatrician at CHEO in Ottawa, uh, who is the current chair of the, um, of the committee. Uh, Dr. Joanne Morel, a colleague of mine from the Montreal Children's Hospital and Dr. Sam Wong, who uh, is a consultant pediatrician working both in Edmonton and in Yellowknife, uh, who have all helped uh, to put this together. So thank you to all of my colleagues. In addition, I uh, wanted to recognize all the reviewers uh, who uh, helped go through the whole entire curriculum with me and with us and uh, gave a very important input. That's the Assembly of First Nations, the METI National Council, Inuit Tepidit Kanatami, the uh, Canadian Pediatric Society's First Nations Inuit and METI Health Committee, and of course, the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health. So, one big question maybe you're asking is why, why are we doing this, um, this teaching curriculum? And uh, one of the reasons, but not, not all of them, is because of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada recommendations. But basically, we know that there is very little education about Indigenous peoples in general in Canada and you know, specifically uh, regarding Indigenous peoples' health. Very few people get any kind of education on this. We are starting to see some uh, movement at high school level and things like that, but still many of the people in Canada in general know very little about Indigenous peoples. We also know that some medical schools have curricula now on Indigenous peoples' health, but many do not. Uh, and at McGill, where I am, we've had something uh, up and running for uh, just about 10 years. Um, and, you know, it's been a struggle at first, but now we are doing more and more. And I think different medical schools are in different evolutions. So many of our medical school graduates have, may have had very little training on Indigenous people's health and specifically very little on children. And we also know that in pediatrics, there are many foreign graduates as well who have not had any kind of education at all on Indigenous people's health, let alone children's health. So it's very important. Now, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, made specific recommendations uh, several years ago, um, 96 in total. Um, many of them were addressing the specific uh, health recommendations, numbers 18 through 24, and we've put up two here to really highlight that this is something that nationally we all need to be thinking about. So call to action number 23, Obviously, trying to get more Indigenous uh, professionals working in the healthcare field, uh, trying to retain those uh, professionals. And third, all healthcare professionals must have some type of cultural competency training. And that's one of the things we're really trying to do with this curriculum. Call to action number 24, calling upon all medical nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing specifically with Aboriginal health issues 
including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations De Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, discussions about treaties, Aboriginal rights, and Indigenous teachings and practices. Now that's something that we have tried to address specifically in this uh, new and improved curriculum. So a bit of the background, uh, as mentioned, this is the second version of the curriculum. The first one was launched in 2011. Um, and how we started was that there was actually Canadian Pediatric Society had put another curriculum together on, uh, I, I believe it was Healthy Active Living. And this is when I was still finishing up as chair of the uh, First Nations Inuit and Metis Health Committee. And we talked as a committee and we felt it would be very important to put something together like that for Indigenous child health. And so um, that was put together in, in the 2009-2010 uh, and we launched in 2011. And what we decided to do at that point was a little bit, little bit different than what we are doing right now. We uh, decided to recruit a champion from each of the 17 pediatric training programs in Canada who were trained to deliver the curriculum to their residents. And the uh, intent was supposed to be, it should be taught at each program about once every two years at a minimum. Now that program included an evaluation framework. We had pre-test and post-test to gauge the resident's knowledge before and after. And a survey was also passed on to uh, collect information on their learning experience. Any faculty members who taught the material were also asked for their comments on the material. So that's what happened from 2011 to probably about 2014. Um, it was taught at different schools, uh, excuse me, different programs. And that data was used to inform the second edition of the resource. So between 2016 and 2018, the Curriculum Development Committee held face-to-face -face meetings, uh, mostly here in Montreal, the Montreal Children's Hospital. And in, the, um, in 2019, in November, we had an external review done with all of our um, the national Indigenous uh, organizations. And final edits have been made since November. So the older version had just two modules um, or two different sections. The newer one that we are launching today has four different modules, um, which uh, you can see a brief outline of them here on your slide. These uh, modules are separate, but they are really interconnected. So they really are meant to flow from one right down right to the next one. And the delivery of this curriculum is really going to provide a, a, a the basic foundational understanding of specific issues related to the health and well-being of First Nations, Inuit, and Metis children and youth in Canada. We have information such as demographics and data, medical conditions, uh, colonizations, etc. I'm going to explain that a little bit more as we go along. And these modules were obviously, uh, we started several years ago, so they were uh, intended to be delivered in person. So that was in the pre-COVID uh, restrictions that we're all in now, which hopefully are uh, being lightened up across the country. But the intent is still for these modules to be presented in person as much as possible uh, using PowerPoint presentations. Obviously there could be um, uh, modifications to that if needed to deliver by Zoom if that's needed or some other format. The slides and the accompanying speaker notes should provide the presenter with all the information required to deliver the material. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, neither I nor the other committee members can't go to every single uh, program across the country. So we're really hoping that some uh, faculty members at those programs will be able to take this material and use it and give a presentation uh, to their residents there. For any staff who may be less familiar with the presentation topics, background reading and resources are provided. The resource listing is very extensive and is intended for reference only. We don't really expect everyone to read through every resource, but that information is provided if needed. If questions arise from the residents uh, during the presentation, the presenters have all those resources to look for uh, and give an answer. If not on the spot, then can come back to the resident later on.
So this is what the, um, these are the basically page one of the four different models, uh, excuse me, modules. Uh, the modules have been developed and formatted with a pretty consistent look and feel. Each module includes a PowerPoint presentation. And what's very different with this, uh, the newer version, is that we have a lot more material to offer to the speakers. So there is a companion speaker's notes handout and a handout of recommended readings for presenters and residents. Each module includes learning objectives as well as some summary takeaway points at the end. Most of the modules ha are either interactive and or have some short videos in them to make it a little bit more interesting for the residents. As mentioned, detailed speaking notes are in the presenter notes documents, and presenters are encouraged to incorporate any pertinent local data information that would be relevant to their talk or to make any updates as needed. In the older version, we actually tried to, um, basically for each teaching site, we tried to uh, get information specific for that area, such as who are the Indigenous peoples they are going to meet, um, in their teaching institutions, and it proved to be very difficult. So uh, this module is intended to be presented so more with more general information. Any presenter who wants to present some specific, specific information for their teaching site can do so. The program is designed specifically for pediatric residents, and, but could be given to any other uh, healthcare providers as well, although it is designed for pediatric residents. Each module should take roughly about 60 minutes to deliver, and ideally they would be presented consecutively, but again, we know that might be difficult during protected teaching time. Ideally, presenters should have some experience providing health care for First Nations Inuit and, Meti and or Meti children and youth, although it's not absolutely necessary. So this is just one of the slides, and actually one of the slides that really reminds me that I wanted to go through some of the uh, learning objectives with you. So I'm just gonna run through those briefly to give you some idea of what is gonna be taught in those uh, different modules. So for module one, uh, residents will have a better knowledge of terminology and demographics of indigenous people. So we, we actually start from the very basics, you know, who is an indigenous person? What are the, what are the differences between First Nations and Indian Metis? Demographics were taken from the 2016 census plus several other sources as well. Basic historical considerations for Indigenous people. Now, I often get asked why that's so important, but every single time we do have any kind of consultation with other Indigenous peoples, we feel this is just one of the most basic things that all Canadian people need to know about, and it's very important and has very strong implications for our, our health uh, even today. So some of the idea, things that are talked about in that uh, historical uh, discussion is you know, population changes and population loss after contact with Europeans. Um, we discuss the Royal Proclamation. We discuss the British North America Act that created Canada and what are those implications for Indigenous peoples today. The Indian Act is discussed and what are those restrictions. And then treaties are discussed and, and why they still have an impact on people today. We tie all that historical consideration discussion into the modern day relationship with the federal government and its responsibilities towards indigenous peoples. One of the last, we finish up with a discussion about the non-insured health benefits um, because that is something that throughout the country we have just heard so much about how healthcare providers don't really understand what is covered, medications, other things that are, that are covered. And so we address that specifically. Module two is uh, probably the longest module. Uh, and this is the one that we, we talk about specifically with the medical conditions affecting indigenous children and youth. And we go through specific recommendations for the care of indigenous children and youth, including screening guidelines. The first half of this module is actually developed in quiz format to be a lot more interactive. Um, and the second half is a little bit more didactic. There was so much material here, we actually had to take away a little bit, uh, but we feel we really come up with a, a good core knowledge of what are the uh, 
health conditions that all pediatric residents should know about for indigenous peoples. The specific recommendations are addressed for each specific health condition as we go through along the way in the module. Module three, residents will have a better knowledge of social determinants of health for indigenous children. And here we really try to cover as much as we can about what affects children's health. So things such as housing and overcrowding are discussed. Poverty levels, education and difficulties in education in the communities, drinking water and getting safe drinking water in communities, and many other things are discussed in the social determinants of health. We discuss how colonization continues to affect indigenous peoples and some of the topics that we talk about there is the residential schools and the ongoing legacy of the residential schools, the foster care system and how this seems to be continuing the colonization process. And we, we discuss racism uh, specifically and racism specifically in the medical system and considerations that all pediatric residents should know about. And we finish up with talking about indigenous peoples and cultures and just make it clear that there is no one indigenous culture in Canada. Uh, there are so many diverse nations uh, across the country and many uh, great diversity of languages, traditional teachings and spirituality. And we go through all that in this third module. In module four, uh, we finish up with uh, residents that will have a better knowledge of culturally, culturally safe care for indigenous children and youth. Resiliency of indigenous peoples, because there is so much strength among indigenous peoples, so much strength in the communities. And you know, sometimes in the media, it is portrayed that you know, indigenous peoples, we are just here and we're all poor and struggling and that is just not the case. So we want to make it very clear that these are very strong nations across the country. The history taking is addressed with videos, uh, videos that were created uh, showing appropriate history taking for an Inuit uh, family and for a First Nations family specifically. Uh, which were done these actually were done with the first um, with the first mod, uh, module done several years ago uh, but uh, we feel they are still very very pertinent uh, it's not mentioned specifically in the learning objectives but we talk about allyship and how indigenous peoples are looking for allies rather than you know the doctors coming in as saviors for uh, for the peoples and we finish up with some ideas for advocacy, for um, how to advocate for Indigenous children, and we, uh, especially what the CPS is doing uh, for that. So these are just a few different uh, slides that, that come from the different modules. I think the first one on the top there, exercise, uh, I believe that comes from the second, um, uh, goodness, I can't remember now. I think it's from the second module. Um, the housing is, is from the social determinants of health uh, section. Um, the, uh, the bottom right, uh, the person you see is Dr. Rada Jetty, who gave a talk about being an ally uh, to one of the CPS conferences. And uh, that uh, just some examples of what we're going to be doing. So there are graphs, there are quizzes, uh, there are some case studies that are in there. Um, maps, images, and videos, where we really tried to make it a little bit more interactive and uh, less didactic uh, with this one, although it's, it's a bit, it's a mixture. As mentioned, something that is new and improved with this version is we will have a user guide available uh, for the presenters. And uh, Indigenous Child and, and Youth Health in Canada, a module-based curriculum for pediatric residents. Um, we, in that user guide, there'll be a project background in there, overview of the curriculum, specific instructions about how to use the modules, general instructions for the presenters, and this is where you're going to find all the resources and references for all the material that is presented and can be used you know, long-term if, if you are looking for more information later on.
Again, new and improved with this version is we have specific speaking notes for basically every single slide of the uh, module. So there are uh, four modules, there are four sets of speaker notes with uh, specific uh, recommendations of things to discuss in each, uh, for each slide. So we had to cut down a lot of the material in each slide. There, there's so much to discuss. So we really tried to make the slides look as user-friendly and as possible. We didn't want to overload them. And a lot of the material that the speaker can use as well, uh, information is in the speaker notes. Um, so that will be up to each presenter to decide how much or how little of uh, that material they want to discuss for each slide. Now, how to access the materials? They are available now on the website. Uh, I, I was just speaking with Roberta and Elizabeth. We may modify a few of the slides here and there, but they are available now and uh, can be downloaded and accessed. Um, so it says cps.ca slash en slash indigenous health. Uh, the link takes you to the CPS members center and all materials are available to members. Now, if you're not a member, you can have access to that, but that one will go through an email to info at cps.ca and uh, they will contact you about how to get access to this. It is currently available in English only, uh, but the French version will be available in fall 2020. It takes a little longer to get it uh, translated. And at this point, um, I can open things up for questions. And again, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone who helped put this together, uh, the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health and everyone at the CPS, especially Elizabeth Moreau for making this a reality. So that's really the uh, curriculum. We just wanted to launch it. We wanted to introduce it uh, to everyone and let you know it is available and I'll be happy to take any questions. Elizabeth, I will ask you to kind of moderate and go through the questions with me. Yep, so if anybody has any questions or comments, if you could just put them in the chat box. I don't see anything right now, but um, please feel free to put them in there and then we can, um, Dr. Saylor can feel those. Uh, maybe Kent, uh, in, while people are getting their thoughts together and writing their questions down, could you say a few words about, um, for people who are interested in um, teaching this in their center, could you give a few words of advice on, on how to approach that and, and what uh, people might do? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um... And uh, I think the first thing to do is to, is to take a look at it because there is a lot of material that's there when you, when you, uh, when you download it. Um, and if possible, uh, uh, the ideal thing would be to look at each slide and look at the speaker's notes that come with it because there is quite a lot of material that's in addition that's in the speaker's notes. Um, and so, Th that's going to be very important to kind of get a good look at it first uh, to um, to help prepare yourself. And we are hoping that um, our partners at the different training programs can then approach their program directors and say, we have a ready-made presentation on Indigenous child health to be presented to the pediatric residents and try to get this into the protected teaching uh, at the different uh, at the different teaching sites. Uh, now, as mentioned, this can be used, uh, and and you know you can people can feel free to modify it if if needed if they are doing presentations to nursing students or nursing staff for that matter. Um, family medicine residents uh, would also find this extremely useful. A lot of the material, um, you know, module two is very specific for indigenous children and, um, and but all the other modules is it, very very pertinent uh, for uh, family medicine and, and other um, uh, different uh, fields as well and it looks like the host has asked me to start my video so I'm going to start my video and say hello to everyone hello everybody 
There we go. And so along those lines, Kent, there's a question from um, Stacey Margerison. Uh, would you recommend, if feasible, co-presenting this information with a member of a local Indigenous community or an Indigenous faculty member? That would be, uh, I think, an ideal situation um, because, you know, a, a person giving the lecture, um, ideally they will have, you know, a, a lot of experience working with Indigenous uh, clients, but when you have somebody who lives it, who lives it on a daily basis um, and sees what the realities of, of their children, their grandchildren, what they go through, uh, and parents struggling, uh, it, it makes a world of difference. So some ideas would be an, a parent uh, could be a very good idea. Uh, an elder would be wonderful as well because they have lived their whole life usually in the community and they will know this very well. So it would be wonderful to have an Indigenous person there with you. And a question for Jacqueline Ogilvie, which speaks to the situation that we're in now. Um, if the presentations have to be delivered virtually, can you suggest any modifications to um, maintain that interactivity? Is there any pre-reading or pre-exercises that t uh, instructors can give the residents ahead of time that they can bring to a virtual session? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And, you know, I wish I could say there is this one resource that you can go to that will really give a very good summary of, uh, of what, what is presented in here. And the reality is we had to get all this information from so many different locations. Uh, it, it would be very, very difficult to do so. Um, I believe a good place to always start is is actually the website of the National Collaborating Center. There's there's a lot of good information uh, that is on there. Uh, actually, a very good website that's easy to uh, navigate through, and a lot of the readings are you know they're not you know 30 pages long. They're they're relatively short, and they have a very very good. Um, uh, information there. So that is one place that that has some very good information. Uh, we don't have that one great child health, Indigenous child health resource just yet. Uh, so it may be a little hard to direct them towards just one uh, location. A question from Melanie about um, whether personal bias and racism in the healthcare system are addressed in the curriculum. Yes, so definitely uh, personal bias is addressed when we talk about cultural safety. Uh, one of the um, you know the mainstays of, of, of being a culturally safe um, provider is to do a self reflection of what are your own views and beliefs come to realities with with that that and that realizing that not all people hold the same beliefs that you hold uh, so that that is something that is uh, addressed specifically in the discussions about cultural safety now the uh, uh, examples uh, discussions about racism we we sure do talk about that we talk about um the case of brian sinclair and how you know he was basically ignored for 34 hours and passed away in, in the emergency room of the hospital um we take uh, we talk about uh, a young woman uh, a woman named michelle i believe it's michelle labrec who uh, went to an emergency room and received a prescription of uh, with a beer bottle with an X through it, uh, as uh, that's what was recommended by the physician. Uh, so we do recognize that there is racism, both systemic and really uh, individual, that happens in the healthcare system. So those things are addressed. There's a thank you in there, Kent, from Radha Jetty, who is the current chair of the First Nations Inuit and Métis Health Committee. She's heading off the call because she's on service, but looking forward to delivering it. Thanks, Radha. Nice to see you. And thanks for your help in putting this all together. Thank you so much. Lots of hard work put into this. Elizabeth, are you seeing any other questions? I don't see any other questions, no. Nope. Uh, Andrew Link is asking when it's available. 
and um, uh, Charlotte F Folston is asking, will clerks and medical students get this curriculum? So uh, first for Andrew's question, hi Andrew, nice to, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is available now and this is available on the website um, as cps.ca uh, slash indigenous health. Um, and as mentioned, we may be making a few minor little tweaks to a few of the slides, but it is available for, for now. Um, and the question, is it available for medical students and, and uh, in the programs? And that really is up to all of you who are out there. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, the program directors will be notified about this. And usually there's a specific faculty person who is in charge of medical students and uh, education for medical students. So they are all welcome to this. And we're really looking for all of you to spread the word about this, uh, bring this to the attention of those staff members, and it, hopefully it can be taught to many, many students, residents, and beyond. And there's a comment about high school students as well. Um, so for high school students, this one, actually module one could probably be easily uh, done uh, with high school students. Uh, module two uh, would not really be that pertinent. That really one, that one really talks about the uh, specific medical conditions. Uh, but many of the uh, three and four can all be taught. Maybe not so much the advocacy specifically for what a pediatric resident can do, but there is tons of material that is can be appropriate for high school students as well. It wasn't the intended audience, but you'd have to look at the modules uh, to uh, to see what you can teach. But for sure, there, there is lots of material there for students. And a specific question about um, adapting it for other audience uh, from Stacy. If we were going to adapt the curriculum to other, other residency programs, would it mostly be just module two that would require adaptation? It would be mostly module two, yes. Uh, a lot of that, like, you know, for um, if you were giving it to family medicine, obviously they need to know about everything for children there. Uh, it is not designed specifically for consultant pediatricians. It's just the basic information we have. Uh, so that one, uh, you would need to supplement it uh, with some information about adults as well. Um, the... I'm just thinking as uh, module one for sure, module three, actually all of them would be pertinent. We focus a little bit more on children when we talk about uh, the foster care system, but that one is, you know, that information is really pertinent for everyone to know about. So I, I think it can be used across the board. Um, here's an important one, quite, uh, can't, um, sorry, the chat just, uh, wondering whether, <clears throat> or how residents may be assessed on this aspect of their learning in the process of their training? Oh, that's an excellent question. And um, mm -hmm. so, again, with mod the, the first version that we did in 2011, we did a pre and a post uh, uh, evaluation just to see what that was the level of residents' knowledge and um, it, we learned a lot that uh, most people again don't don't really have the basic things and, and I got to say you know I, I've done many different presentations and I've done kind of a, a pre-test at many different locations with with pediatric staff and even pediatric staff know you know some know the basics some do not even know the basics so uh, I, I was I was actually quite surprised about that um, now, we are not in a position to, you know, be handing out, um, you know, questionnaires or surveys right now. Uh, I, I do uh, would like to see what is on the Royal College exams, but I don't even know. Uh, we haven't addressed that that issue specifically. Thanks, um, Kenton. Question from Sarah Jasemi: Is there a mentorship program or a train the trainer program? for teachers of the curriculum? Okay, so excellent question. And again, that is what we uh, did in the first one. Um, and at for module two right now, we do not have that train the trainer program. 
Um, and if there are specific requests, um, I don't know if, if Elizabeth, we are prepared to kind of at least take those requests and, and, um, and maybe that is something that we could possibly discuss having some type of uh, program like, like that in the future, but it's really going to depend on the demand. So if people look at it and they feel they don't feel quite comfortable um, to, uh, to do that, this teaching on their own, I think you will actually uh, with all the information that we do and I think most people will. Um, Elizabeth, would they send something to info at cps.ca if, if they had a, re a request like that? Yep, they can send it to info at cps.ca or they can send it to me. I'll send it a link after this meeting um, with the direct link to the materials. So um, yeah, absolutely. If you, if you are interested in that, please let us know. Any other questions coming up, Elizabeth? Um, congratulations from uh, Sam Wong, who is also our current president. Thanks for joining us, Sam. I don't see any other questions. Oh, um, from Eduardo Vides. Um, he uh, asks, will these new modules be mandatory or are they optional? Yes, so right now it, they are optional it, and we are really hoping for our colleagues at the different uh, teaching programs to take this information to their program directors and advocate to have it taught at the, at the different programs. So they are optional, but we are hoping that they will be done at each program. I don't see any other questions. Do you have any parting words of advice, um, Kent, for participants, uh, uh, prospective teachers before we, before we sign off? Well, maybe no words of advice, but I, I have to, I'll, I'll just say, you know, putting this together, um, the first one, I, I think, goodness, I started the first one in 2008. Uh, and that one took a few years to put all the information together. And then this one again with, with the help of colleagues. Um, and it was such a wonderful learning experience uh, to know what, not just what the medical conditions are, although, you know, there's a lot that we, that I did not know about that I learned doing it. Um, but I, I have to tell you, one of the most fascinating parts was, was knowing uh, the history behind a lot of these things. And, and it was really so interesting. You know, I grew up in a, in a, on a First Nations Reserve, and so much of the history I did not even know about. And so I can imagine that many people throughout Canada do not know many, uh, a lot of the details. And, you know, why you, you see Indigenous peoples ranting and raving about, about the government not sticking up to what they agreed to when you learn and go through the history of what's in the acts what's in the indian act what's in the treaties you'll learn so much more ab about why why that is and why we're in the situation that we're in and it, it really speaks to how much that we are looking for allies to work with us to improve indigenous people's health and it, the other last thing i'll finish up with was that the strength, the strength of the, the individual communities and the ind indigenous peoples of, you know, not just laying down and say, okay, government, we need more money, we need more money. There's so much more that is happening out there across the country. It's really wonderful to see. Thanks, Kent. I, I think that's um, a super positive way to end. However, there are a couple of more questions. so. Can we take just a couple more questions? For sure. Um, from Charlotte Faustin, is there any information included regarding specifics of delivery or parenting in Indigenous communities? Okay, so that one, we do not have any specifics other than some of the recommendations for um, addressing some of the health issues. Um, so, you know, you could, um, extend the teaching about talking about trying to return to traditional diet 
and trying to get away from some of the, uh, the fast food and other foods. And those are discussions that you can have with parents about, you know, a, a positive change they can make in their child's life. Uh, the same for physical activity of returning to some traditional um, uh, forms of physical activity uh, are, are things that parents can take to heart as well. Um, and we do talk a, a lot about the strengths of parents and, and grandparents in there. So uh, it, it is addressed. We don't have a specific section on Indigenous peoples uh, and parenting, uh, but a lot of it is embedded in there. And then a comment and a question. There's a comment from Stace, uh, excuse me, Stacy Margerison um, that the Royal College is making Indigenous education a mandatory part of education. So pleased to have such collaborative and broadly supported curriculum to deliver. And sort of a kind of follow up from Jill Roberge who asks, has there been any movement to have the content of these modules um, and or cultural safety reflected in the EPAs? Okay, someone please help me with EPAs. It's Andrew here, folks. Uh, uh, I sit on the, uh, the Royal College Pediatric Committee. And uh, so an EPA is an entrustable professional activity. And it's, it's one of the probably 25 EPAs, each specialty like pediatrics will have through different phases on entering your specialty, middle of your specialty and entering into uh, professional practice and the EPA really could be for example looking after a critically ill or injured child and then, then there'd be all sorts of little subtitles in that that you would have check boxes where you are evaluated on your competencies not just writing a test but people have observed you doing things so one might be cultural competency and there are some cultural competency EPAs in the pediatric framework and I'm certainly going to take back Kent what you and the committee have done to our our committee and have a look at this to make sure we fine tune it so it's simpatico and people are real realize that this resource is here for program directors. So I, again, I thank everybody for doing that, but we'll make sure both the pediatric chairs of Canada and the program directors uh, are well aware of this. Yeah, so that sounds like an, an excellent area for advocacy to get uh, this um, some discussion going with the Royal College and um, perhaps uh, the First Nations Inuit and Metis Health Committee can have some role there. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, Kent, there's a question from a Tammy Wong, pediatric resident, wondering whether it's possible for interested residents to look through the modules without a presentation while they're waiting for someone to deliver it to them or for residents to teach one another. Elizabeth, you're going to have to help me with that. Do all pediatric residents, are they me members of CPS? They are, so they can certainly access all the materials through the website. Yeah, so Tammy, you can access it, you can look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, ideally, it's much better when you've worked with Indigenous peoples to, to really kind of know the context, but it is there for you to look at and learn from. Any other questions or comments? So if not, please, as I said, feel free to email any one of us uh, after the fact, if you have thoughts, questions, comments. Um, on behalf of CPS, uh, my executive director who is on the call somewhere, Marie Davis, our current president, Sam Wong, um, I wanna thank the National Collaborating Center on Indigenous Health for their partnership in this project. Um, it was a full, complete partnership. We could, this would not be happening without them in the way that it happened. So to Roberta Stout, Donna Atkinson and Margot Greenwood, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support, uh, patience, expertise, and believing that this project would come to fruition. Um, and obviously um, all the thanks go to Kent Saylor. I'm sure you can tell that this was you know, complete labor of love for him. Um, many, many hours over the course of years um, that he put into this. So Kent, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. And we'll work really hard to get this um, in front of uh, teachers and influencers and students over the next, uh, over the coming weeks and months. So thank you. <laughs>